Today on the Cameron Journal Podcast, I am joined by Roger Friedman. My microphone is not close by. <laughs> I'm joined by Roger Friedman. He's the author of a book called Erasing America, Broken Politics, Broken Country. It says here, Erasing America, Broken Politics, Broken Country is a compelling exploration of the current political climate in the United States. This thought-provoking book, penned by Roger Friedman, is dedicated an Ameri- a dedicated American and retirement wealth planner, delves into the alarming rise of socialist policies in Washington, D.C. and across the nation. It critically examines the actions of self-serving politicians and the media's role in promoting radical progressive agendas. And I, when I first got this press release, this is unusual for what I usually receive here at the show, and I responded immediately and said, we do not agree on America's movement towards socialism. I could do with some more socialism in this country, but let's come on and talk about this. And so here we are, um, and... Uh, we have some great topics to talk about, but I'm going to first welcome Roger, and we're going to find out about him and his book. So welcome to the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you, Cameron. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your book and how you came to write it? Well, I'm a New York City kid. I'm the son of a dry cleaner. Um, I grew up in lower Manhattan. Uh, my dad's store was at Times Square. So I was a city kid whose mom passed unfortunately, when I was 12. So I had to, you know, grow up a little early and work for my dad a lot. So I didn't get in trouble after school, went to state university, studied political science, which was probably the worst decision in four years of my life. But you know, I've, I've since turned the corner. I've been in uh, wealth management, retirement planning, retirement strategy, for the last 38 to 40 years. I uh, built a very big practice there. I was with Morgan Stanley as a senior vice president of wealth management. And today I am now in Florida, still practicing my craft. And Erasing America is actually my seventh book. It is the first one on politics though. Oh, excellent, excellent. So um, what? So, it's, if it's your first book on politics, what inspired you to try to take this on? That's a great question. So, you know, when I, I call it reading the paper, which is actually going to different media websites, you know, instead of waiting yes. for the New York Times or something to be dropped in my driveway. Yes, so my I, paper is now delivered by Apple News. <laughs> or, or, or Newsmax or Fire or whoever. Yes, so yeah, I'd be yes. looking at articles and I see things that I vehemently disagreed with. And... As Ron White would say, I had the right to remain silent. I didn't have the ability. And I'd fire off an email to my sisters, my brother, my friends saying, did you hear about fill in the blank? And I kept doing that over and over. And it occurred to me, why don't I send a one page memo to my friends and family, maybe every Sunday. And on one page, I'll talk about all the nonsense that I read about during the week. Well, it, it, it soon became apparent that I could not limit it to one page. So it became around 1,500 words a week. And after about a half a year of doing that, my sister said, you know, you could turn this into a book, <laughs> which never crossed my mind because I just wasn't thinking about that. Right. All my other books were on retirement planning, financial planning you know, things of that nature. So um, after around 50 weeks, I put it all together, got it professionally edited and uh, had a bunch of first readers look at it. And we released it about uh, three or four weeks ago. Yeah, well, excellent. So uh, (laughs) there's a couple, good, thank you. Um, There's a couple things that I think topics that I definitely want to dive into and we're going we're going to i think start with the easy one and go from there so let's talk about the america's slow decline into socialism um i we could do in my mind with about five tablespoons of socialism in in this country um and and we have you know some great programs that have alleviated the poverty and suffering of people, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, 
TANF, all this type of thing. Um, compared to our OECD peers, we don't have a social safety net, basically, compared to our, our other you know, wealthy nations. So when you say sliding into socialism, what are the concrete examples you find in the world that make it seem like, you know, we're going to be distributing copies of Mao's little red book tomorrow? <laughs> That's a good question. So when I listen to AOC and the squad members, I hear them vehemently denouncing capitalism. Uh, even though they're earning $174,500 a year as Congress people, and uh, AOC is driving a Tesla, which I don't think you get to drive in a socialist society. And one of the things that I notice is that more and more of the regulations coming out of states have to do with how much you earn versus what you're getting in return. For example, in December, California's legislature passed a bill that going forward, a portion of your electricity bill will not be based on how much electricity you use. And I kind of scratch my head at that. I'm thinking, wait a second, I get an electric bill because I use this much electricity. Now it's going to be based on how much money you earn. Okay. And I said to myself, this doesn't happen in America. Okay. This is kind of like Elizabeth Warren. Billionaires should not exist. And then she goes off saying everyone should be equal. There should be equal outcomes of everything. And in this country, you have equal opportunity. Okay. Not equal outcome. For example, Ben Carson, who ran for president, brilliant neurosurgeon, African-American. If there was systemic uh, racism here, he never would have risen to the point that he risen, that he rose to being head of, I think, H -I -H -I -H 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 -S, uh, Health and Human Services under Trump. Uh, it was actually Tim HUD. He was HUD. Housing, housing and Urban Development. Tim Scott. A, a congressman of Florida, African-American, there would be no African-Americans in Congress or graduates of Harvard or Yale or Princeton if systematic racism was what they said it is, okay? And as I listen to, you know, what is going on in Congress, especially what is going on in the blue states of Illinois, in Seattle, in California, in New York, New Jersey, I'm really terrified by the turn that the country has taken, that they're abandoning capitalist principles, which made this country the richest country in the history of mankind and the most successful. You can't say that of Russia, Venezuela, North Korea, or Cuba. And Karl Marx himself said, socialism is the path to communism. Okay. So it made me feel very, very uncomfortable okay and i started writing more and more about it okay you get the kids that are in college now many of them say socialism is the way to go well a lot of times their parents are the ones paying the 40 50 60 thousand uh, dollar annual charges for them to go to college and they're all in favor for those that have student loans they're all in favor of president biden canceling their student loan by a stroke of the pen. I disagree with this. I have a problem with everything that's going on here. How do you feel well, about it? Well, <laughs> um, so let, let's go through a couple things. Um, so one, I would, I would say in a manner of pushing back, when it comes to systemic racism, this is a, a fallacy that I think has come up a lot that somehow a few bright names means that there's no systemic racism. That's a lot harder argument to make when you go back to Thurgood Marshall, first black Supreme Court justice. I like when he came up through law, systemic racism wasn't just a problem. It was codified in law. Um, I, I, I agree, but times have changed. 
t- times times have changed, but I think the I think the the issue that we kind of remember is we didn't stop redlining cities until the early 1970s. My mom graduated high school in 1974. 50 years ago. Yes, and that seems like a long time. It is like a long you, time. Have you been alive that long? Time, long? The, no, not, not close, but not yet. Um, Cameron, uh, you you have not been alive for 50 years. Not, okay? not close, but not I yet. I was in high school 50 years ago. So yeah. I've seen the change that you're talking about. But that, But that's also my point is, we right. still have people alive today for whom these policies were were real. Absolutely, yes, we do. That it, when so I when I look at it in terms of the human lifespan, I can say, yeah, it's for me sitting here at thirty five, almost thirty six years old in two months. It seems like long, long ago and far, far away. But my father grew up in the Jim Crow South. He's still alive. To, I, he can go through the town he grew up in in Tuscaloosa and say that was white only, that was black, um, all this time. Absolutely. So it, I think yeah. it is. I mean, so to say something, you know, say something was really, you know, a long time ago, to me is a little bit hard of an argument when people we still have human beings alive who lived it and had that reality as part it's of in their our lives. history, but it's not our current. <laughs> excuse me. It's not our current makeup. There is no government policy that says racism is codified in law. It is not. It yes. used to and, be, the, and the Supreme Court has has said 1976 that when it comes when it comes to you know these sorts of policies, if it, it cannot be de jure, which is a fancy Latin term meaning of law, but it can be de facto, which is another fat and ter- fancy Latin term meaning the way things that are, and. The I, I think what's uh, and and your point that we have moved on and policies have changed and we've come a, a long way in the that time is well taken and needs to be talked about more. I have so this issue with Gen Z when they t- c- complain about gender stuff and LGBTQ stuff and all this type of thing. I'm like I grew up in the 90s when Matthew Shepard was dragged behind a truck by two mad dudes in Wyoming and I grew up in Colorado so it wasn't that far away. Um, and uh. Um, and that was a national news story for six weeks. When Ellen Generous came out, that was a national news story for two for two months. We have come so far in a very short period of time. And so your point to say, yeah, we used to do that, times have changed, is a very good one. I think it's also important to remember we still live in the legacy of those policies. Like when you You're look at the map of correct. Chicago, we, we the lines the haven't moved, <laughs> like the neighborhoods we, haven't we live moved. In the legacy. And there are people. <laughs> There are people in every single town that are racist. We yeah. know that. And and bless their hearts. And I've always said, I don't mind if you want to go home and be racist. God bless you. But just when it comes to public policy time, we're right. not going to be in that energy with you. But if you want to go right. home and come be my guest in your own home. In, in your like, four walls, but not outside. Yes. Exactly. So, exactly. so let me ask you a question. I just want your racism to stop at your property line when, you're, when your lawn ends. Right. That's all I care about. So, so Cameron, <laughs> here's a question. Uh, I've written about it and I've read about it. California is on the verge of reparations for African-Americans for wrongs that have been done in the past. The numbers have been bantied around 300,000, a million, 700,000, all these kind of numbers. For California, that was never a slave owning state. So I'm going to compromise of 1850 expressly prevented that from being the case. So I'm going to ask you, why is this so important to California now with a 68 to $70 billion budget deficit and governor Newsom, you know, looking very, very nice and all his hair gel saying everything is wonderful and we're going to do everything for everybody. And they don't have any money to do any of this except by keep raising taxes. And there's the exodus to Texas and Florida and Nevada because they have more rational tax policies. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to go along and see what California is doing is a good idea. I don't live in California for a reason. And I've always said I could never live in California because I would never get anything done because all I would do would be driving to Sacramento, standing outside the state capital, yelling at them at how poorly run their state is. Okay, I, I, um, I get that. I get and that. so I, I, I've, I've never been a big fan of reparations myself. I don't think at this point in time 
it is germane to the discussion. I think that becomes a point. financial race to the bottom. I think there's a lot of room for scam. Um, and as someone who has like verified bona fide African American heritage, perfectly traceable, I have all the receipts and would be, you know, eligible for the check, all this type of thing. I don't think that's helpful. I would rather them put that money into things that would actually do good for the community at large. So rather than just send out money to people, have you considered actually doing something about LA's homeless problem, which disproportionately affects people of color? Have you, you yeah. build some social housing, build some mass transportation, finish your stupid high-speed rail line that they, is cost they billions and goes go nowhere. Of that, <laughs> and, and none of it went anywhere. Their high-speed rail line was a disgrace. It and never. And this is why I can't live in California. This is why I can't live in California. I get um, it. Because I'll, I'll be kind of like, there's um, other ways to help these disadvantaged communities. But it's not by resources. writing a check. It's no. not by putting money in their checking account every month like they did during COVID. The amount of fraud that uh, of the COVID money was somewhere north of forty to fifty billion dollars. But are, are we going to criticize the fraud in the PPP loan program, which was egregious? I mean, yeah. egregious. Yeah. The way businesses use that was absolutely beyond the pay. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, and then that was, and, and the, the sad thing when you get in, we're going to turn, come back to capitalism here in a minute. And because when you get into these sorts of programs, there was a lot of people like your Tom Brady's and your Buffalo Wild Wings that took the money, didn't need it. That's the first problem. They take it and they put it in money market or a CD to earn interest. Right, yeah, um, which causes asset price inflation, all this sort of thing. And uh, the, the the other half of that um, that I think is is most unfortunate is that a lot of those loan a lot of those loans ended up being forgiven. It ended up being uh, honestly a a great social program for business. I mean, there's some old French socialists that would applaud us for how good government is doing handing yeah, out but, cash but to remember, business. In this but country. remember one thing, Cameron. In the height of the COVID lockdowns, yes. who was able to remain open? Home Depot. Yes. Sam's. Yes. Walmart. All the gigantic companies were allowed to remain open. All the mom and pops were forced to close. No, and I and I I will say when it comes to the COVID, you know, lockdowns, all this type of thing, I have a lot of friends who are fellow business owners. Um and who were adversely affected um my friend brady mcslain who's appeared on this podcast in our fashion series she's a bridal seamstress and at the time she was working she has her own shop now but she was working in a shop at the time right. and um you know she literally was you know was like i you know not allowed to go to work because denver went the lockdown so not allowed to go to work not allowed to see brides get paid do their dresses weddings were being canceled so brides didn't you know weren't getting their dresses altered, all this no type wedding, of thing. No wedding, no dress. Yeah. Yes, no weddings, no dresses. And ultimately, so I mean, so she literally went from earning over six figures a year to almost nothing in the blink of an eye. Wait and a those... second. Over six figures is seven figures. She made a million dollars as a seamstress. No, six figures. I said okay. over six figures. Yes, over six figures. She's only a one woman operation. Um, over six, six figures. Six, I mean, low I mean, six she figures. Was, Okay. Yeah, she was yes, low six figures. She was doing a nice, tidy hundred thousand dollar a year business in bridal alterations. That's which great, is great. Um, and That's so the American dream. Yes, and so for her family, and at the time she was the primary breadwinner for her family, they went from a decent middle class lifestyle to zero overnight, and it was a huge scramble. And thank goodness, because um she didn't have necessarily the resources to get a hold of this free government money sort of thing. Um, thank goodness for family and friends because she has friends who are lawyers and other things that were able to stay open. Thank God and for Cameron family bailed and friends. her out. Uh, me and Jessica and a couple other people, <laughs> you know, thank God for family and friends who were able to be helpful. Um, and eventually she was able to get back to work. But I mean, the, the simple matter is those were lost earnings that went on for months and months and months. Right. Um, and, and research has shown that we probably didn't need to take the lockdown route. That's another podcast. Um, no, you're, you're, if you you're, want to yeah, go read about that, right. That's about I have my article on our politicized yeah. pandemic where I go into the research on that. If you right. want to go read about that, but, um, yes, I mean, the, the, we have these, you know, some of the decisions that have been made are not that great when it comes to 
free government money. I've I did a podcast on universal basic income. And I said, you know what? It's a nice idea. And I looked at the research. Sweden tried it. It worked great. Stockton, California, the city of Stockton, California, did a pilot program for this. The province of Ontario in Canada did a pilot program for this. And it was very successful. People were able to get health care, get housing, get out of a hole, all this type of thing. I think as a temporary relief sort of thing, it could be a nice idea. I don't know that it's a structurally good permanent idea. I do firmly believe people need something to do. They need a reason to get up every day and go do something, engage in something, make something, create something, earn something. The people need something to do. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Someone said to me not long ago, basically, many Americans are lazy and stupid. Okay. You know, look who they voted for, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go there whether or not that's genius or, or the opposite. But I recently read about programs in California, I think one of them was in Palm Springs, where there's a transgender mayor or head of the city council, I'm not sure which, where they gave about $1,000 a month to everyone who's transgender, no matter their income. So if they were transgender, they got money. And I said to myself, why on earth is this happening? Well, the mayor, you know, it was important to him or her, I'm not sure, uh, because you know that's their belief. And there are different places in California that were experimenting with if you're transgender, you're gonna get money. And you know, my sense is this could have been more well thought out. Okay. Well, my you're first question is a why? very small sliver of the population very and small. saying, here's money because we believe you need it, and it's coming from the taxpayers. Because the government has no money to give unless they take it from the taxpayers or they create debt, which is then paid off by the taxpayers. I mean, those, I mean, th that is the type of program that I definitely, I mean, I, I love the spirit. I love the energy. I don't know that government is the best institution for that sort of thing. You're absolutely um, right. I, I would say if we want to do that, well, I would say if we want to support the trans community and I'm totally on board i would say let's get the gays the lesbians the days let's have some fabulous fundraising dinners let's form a new charity or in support of us so and let's do this at the pri that's something where i don't i think the private sector can do very well yeah like you remember when all those musicians can be came brilliant together at that right you when all the musicians came together after 9 11 right uh, there was like scores of music fame bruce springsteen and yeah all the and they raised untold millions of dollars. You know, that's something that could happen rather than the government saying, we're going to give people money simply because they're transgender or something else. And, and this and this is to say, and we'll, we'll loop back to capitalism on this, this is to say there are times when, structurally speaking, government can do really great things. And I think one of the things that our government ha did well in the aftermath of the, of the depression is we began to put in place the things that mitigated the worst aspects of capitalism. And I think one of the major issues we've had in the last 45 years with the deregulation of Ronald Reagan, and I write about this in my essay, 1977, the rise of discounters and deregulation, um, was that we undid the great regulatory framework that made the great American high possible. You know, it was, yes, we'll throw out the regulations. Yes, we'll lower the taxes. Yes, we'll li liberate you know, trucking rates and airplane fares and all these sorts of things. Not realizing that the reason why we were able to have the wonderful life we did after World War II through the early 80s was because of that regulatory framework. And although I think some people described it, John Birch Society, other people, Cook Brother, all this type of thing, the Federalist Society described it as socialism and practically on the road to communism. The reality is it gave the American middle class and even the working class the highest standard of living, the best lifestyle, and the most opportunity probably in human history. And my parents' generation, the boomers, benefited from the system that their parents gave them. And they've done very, very well. And no hate. Bless them. They've done well. Great. No hate, glad you did. 
Um, but the unfortunate reality is in the intervening time, the framework that allowed that to happen has been consistently undermined. And now we have a wealth inequality problem in this country that is starting to get very dystopian and starting to look Eastern European, South American. And it's it will not be very long in our society until we have cloistered communities of wealthy people with security and gates and the great unwashed masses eking it out outside. Yeah, and that's, question, that's but... the America we're careening towards. And that is a political powder keg waiting to happen. Cameron, th th this came up last week in discussion amongst a group of people that I talk with. So you remember maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago, Bill Gates built a gigantic home somewhere in the Seattle suburbs, maybe Bellevue. I'm not sure where. And it's, I don't know, 40,000 square feet, some outrageous amount of square footage like that. Yeah. And, you know, Elizabeth Warren and everyone else chimed in, who needs a 30,000, 40, 50,000 square foot house? Obviously, no one needs it, okay? But the thing that they totally glossed over was, well, the architects, the landscapers, the builders, the concrete people, you know, all the people that worked on that house for however long it took to, to build, he created a massive amount of work in the community for hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, a huge amount of taxes to the community, and everyone benefited from it. And yes, you know, he has an absurdly large house, and I'm sure that he could you know, ride a motorcycle, you know, down the hallways. And it's not for me to say he shouldn't be able to, but I'm very, very happy that he had 700 workers or however many it was, and he paid every single one of them. He created jobs. He shared the wealth. Okay. Not very far. Well, I mean, that's, or, I mean, that's, well, that's basically an ar a great argument. For, he didn't for... need the pipes made in Alabama. <laughs> OK, so, you know, he he shared them as as far as it needed to build the house. Right. But that's also basically an argument for feudalism of the Lord of the Manor built a new manor and it's done very well for us. What Here's what I would rather see. I would rather see Bill Gates pay some damn taxes in this country. He can have a 10,000 square foot house. I think he'll get along fine. And I would rather those workers be able, I would rather, here's what I'd rather do. I'd rather have middle-class people have slightly higher salaries so they can go buy houses. So those workers who are mostly independent tradespeople will be able to build a long-term business building houses for lots of people. Cameron, let about, me ask you. That's the thing about what, money. When, why do you money, think when money Bill goes Gates, rich people, it doesn't move. It stays. Why do you think Bill Gates a gives the damn what everywhere. you would rather see? He doesn't. I, I'm sure he does not. And that's okay. okay. I'm so sure he does not, you know, would not ever consider. He'd rather him that. drive an old Cadillac than a new Rolls Royce. I get it. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily. I, I'm what I'm. What I'm saying is, money is only useful it's when it moves. It's yeah, nothing more than it's a tool. only useful when it moves. Part right. of the problem with having a society of incredibly, extremely wealthy people. That money's not going anywhere. You hope it moves when they die, but otherwise that money is not really moving. It has no velocity. It's not helping anyone. Those 700 people, yeah, they built his great house. It is in Bellevue, Bellevue Heights, actually. It's about 45,000 square feet. I've seen it. It's really cool. Um, <laughs> but I've never um, seen it. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really nice. It's very, it's very kind of bog standard American. It they could have done more with the design, but it's fine. Um and um uh and that's all fine and well but the reality is once that project is done those people need other projects and businesses to go right. on to the so i don't i don't need the one right i don't but here's the thing is i don't need one bill gates i need 10,000 people like yourself because the money people like you who have businesses and employ people and all this type of thing your money is moving so we don't need just a Bill Gates or a Jeff Bezos or an Elon Musk. We need 10,000 of that talent making ever so slightly less money and yep. having it move through the community. And that's one of the benefits of high tax rates in the 50s right. at 95% 
is it forced money to move because otherwise it went to Washington. So the system was designed such that it, it made people spend money, do R and D, do different things because otherwise it went so in taxes. You said you said something that I'd like to expand on. You said money only has value when it's moving, when it has velocity. Okay. Yeah. And I get that totally a hundred percent. It also today's has, inflation. <laughs> it also has a lot of value when you tie a rope around it and you stick it right here, let's say you have a $100,000 certificate of deposit, okay? It's all your money in the world. It's FDIC insured. That is your security. That is your security blanket, okay? It is very, very valuable to you, even though there's no velocity to it, okay? It's, you know, you take that 100 grand that's in a middle metal cage, says JP Morgan or Bank of America, whatever the CD is, and it creates a lot of security for Joe or Martha or Bill or Patty, okay? So money has a lot of use, even if there's no velocity to it. And that's by security. But I would argue in your certificate to positive scenario, that money has a little bit of velocity because the bank, in order to pay- Bank is lending it out, of course. Right, the bank, which is gonna be paying a lot of interest right now, five and a half percent. I was actually, I was just about to take out a CD. I saw good interest rates at the credit union. Um, <laughs> um, that with the banks, especially a small a smaller institution is immediately going to lend that out, which sure. is good news. Say I'm over here at Widgery Omni Media and I need to take out a loan against my invoices. Um, not that I was doing my accounting this morning or anything, but say I need to take a loan against my invoices, um, you know, then that money is now is now moving. That's not necessarily true for I mean, those shares that Bill Gates own in Microsoft was comprised the mo the bulk of his wealth. That money's not because and here's the problem. If Bill Gates started to massively sell off Microsoft, the price of the stock would tank because he'd be releasing oh, wait a many shares in the market. A lot of his shares. He has made the charity pledge. Are you aware of what that pledge is? Yes. Okay. So yes. an awful, I think it's at least 50% of right. his wealth will go to charity. Um, and Buffett has already started doing that. Buffett's given billions of dollars of Berkshire Hathaway to Bill Gates charity for him to disperse. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does wonderful and tremendous things they fund a lot of people i know a lot of people who have grants or in programs that are funded by them all this type of thing and that during the gilded age we that built public libraries in this country we want to know why there's a guggenheim museum in new york guess who paid for that sure. yeah, why go to any york, university for it. go yes. to any university and it's and the jones library yeah. or the smith yes. gymnasium and that's because jones got off his ass and stroked the 40 million dollar check Yes, and and you'll and depending on what part of the country you're in, you will sometimes see some local names. Like if you're in the right part of the country, you'll see a Whitney. Same way reason yes. there's a museum in New York. If you're in California, John Paul Getty this, John Paul Getty that, John Paul Getty. Exactly. Other I'm from Northwest Arkansas. Sam Walton this, Sam Walton that, Sam Walton the other thing. Yeah. But even regardless of Ellen all that, Carnegie, shit, all of them. Yes, in Den, I come, I grew up in Denver. Betcher, 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 or Ann Schutz. That's the other big one. Spelman Ann Schutz, Ann Schutz, Ann Schutz. <laughs> the, the historically African American Spelman College would not exist were it not for John D. Rockefeller. Of course, okay. and I know, and and Oprah has given bucket loads to Morehouse. For, she has a whole scholarship program for men at Morehouse. Absolutely. Um, yes, there's lots of, you know. But I think you have a problem with the fact that they haven't given away 95% of their wealth yet. I don't care about how much they do or do not give away. What I care about is that the reason this wealth is concentrated in their hands to start with is we have spent the last 40 years lowering taxes and rewriting the tax code to advantage wealth and assets and capital over labor. If you derive your wealth from assets and capital, you pay less taxes than if you derive your wealth from labor. Well, and I that's, that's, that is not so much regulation. That's the tax law that's created by Congress. And so I just said, we've spent the last 40 the years problem, rewriting Congress tax created law. The problem. Yes, I'm saying we're spending the last 40 years rewriting the tax code and lowering taxes to create this terrible imbalance. And on not only would I like to see tax rates increase to where they were in the 80s, because we have a terrible debt problem in this country and we're gonna have to pay for it sometime, might as well get to work. Um, but we also 
have this very wonky tax code that has been Cameron, we don't have a debt problem. People. We have a spending problem. We have a spending problem. The debt is now about $34 trillion. So you're absolutely right. We have a problem, but it's because the government will not stop spending. And I'm saying the government doesn't spend nearly enough. Okay, that, to that's most where of you and I we are pay 180 of, degrees the apart. Sa the sad thing, in the, here, but here's the sad thing in this country. We pay a lot of taxes to a lot of taxable entities, and look how much we don't get. On aggregate, we're paying more for the European, more than the Europeans for less services. You know, and even no, and no matter where you look, we're paying a lot of money to get less. Whether you're looking in taxes, healthcare, education, we spend the most per student per capita. Yeah, we don't do a lot of things our well. Our are lawyer are lower. I agree. Per capita healthcare, we spend the most of our wealth well, We don't have universal access, and we have worse outcomes. It's actually better for a woman to go have a baby in South Africa than it is in the United States. So let me ask you a color. question: The last These are time... all problems we as a society need to solve, and it's going to start with raising some money and to borrow the phrase of FDR, soak the damn rich to do it. Cameron, That's the, simple the, last matter. Time, the, simple matter. the last time you paid your taxes, 2023, okay? Yeah. Let's just pretend it was April 15th. Let's say your tax bill was, pick a number, $6,800. Yeah. Did you give them an extra two grand because you know they needed it? No. Why not? They need it. Give, give them more money. The tax rate should be higher. You don't have to wait for them to to raise the rate. Give them more money voluntarily. I mean, Why I kind of do it because I don't bother itemizing my. Why didn't you do it? Lazy. So. Why didn't you do it? Give the government free money. Well, you know, if you had a tax bill of sixty eight hundred, why not just give them an even ten grand? You know, they need it. I could certainly do that. That's not quite have the you? gotcha you think it is, though. Have you? No. <laughs> I, I I already said I do. I I I already overpay because I don't itemize my expenses because I'm lazy. Right. Like I I I I don't hire. You have the I standard could, deduction. As, right. Yes, especially as a as a someone someone who's self-employed, I really should hire someone to really drill down the tax bill, and I don't. I'm just like, give me my standard deduction. I don't want to do the paperwork. Let me give you your money and I'm going to go on with my life. You should hire um, someone, spread your wealth. You know, you're absolutely right. You know, I really should. I, I, heard, I was on with Rocket Lawyer the other day and I said, I think it's finally time for me to hire someone to do the taxes because I'm I'm done doing it. And it's coming up this year. So I've, I've got to think about it. Um, okay. Yes, no, absolutely. But that, that still isn't the God thing is relying. Here's the problem with that. Every time we try to solve a big systemic society issue by actions of individuals, be that Cameron giving free money to the government, which I certainly could do, um, or asking, you know, ch charitable organizations to solve society's problems, we're still stuck in this pattern. And this is where capitalism, especially late stage capitalism and neoliberalism has been very insidious, is we're still looking at it's the individual problem. It's the individual responsibility. The individual must do it. We cannot solve our big systemic societal issues by merely asking individuals to try to fill in the gap. We've got to do it together or not at all. And I think one of the most terrible things that came out of the Reagan, Thatcher, Clinton, Blair era was a pithy quote from Margaret Thatcher, which said, there's no such thing as society. There's individuals, but no such thing as a as, as society. Everyone think, is self-interested. We know that. Yes. And but I think I think in that within that self-interest, you can harness that for the good of society if you start building systems that advantage everyone and allow individuals to do good things. That was the flaw with the Soviet Union, is they completely bulldozed over it, the individual in favor of the collective they took it too far in the west we did the same thing but in the opposite direction we pretended we weren't a society anymore and prized the individual and we're now living in a situation where we have a nice cadre of about 20 percent of the population that's doing okay while the rest of the 80 percent are figuring out how to buy groceries and pay the rent 
And with a slight, not even a big rejiggering, a slight rejiggering of tax policy and regulation, we could get back to that place where we were after the Depression, after the war, where things are actually good for everyone, not just a select and lucky. You know, you should be very, very grateful, Cameron. Do you want me to tell you why? Why? Because if you said the same thing in the Soviet Union, yes. you'd probably be in the frozen Siberian tundra. Certainly. Because you're talking about yes. how government policies are not the best and you have a problem with it. And I want you to know, I would not have been able to write this book in the Soviet Union or North Korea or Cuba. I'd be in jail. And I'm very, very grateful that I could write this book and sleep well at night, that the Stasi or somebody else is not going to come barging down my door and rip me from my family in the middle of the night and take me to jail. Right. But I'm and I'm not saying that a change in economic policy mm -hmm. should preclude any sort of individual liberty. I would argue we've had more right to free speech in the past than we do to today in some cases. Sure. Um, I think given correct things that are happening culturally and socially that I'm not right. always a huge fan of. I um, mean, I've written about that extensively. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, it, I think it was easier in the past to be, you know, subversive and really, you know, have more kind of freedom of thought. And I'm, I'm not saying that an economic, I'm not saying that increasing economic security should come at the cost of any sort of personal liberty. We can have a wealthy, affluent, beneficial society that has healthcare available, has transit available, takes care of childcare, has great public schools, all this type of thing without getting rid of free speech or freedom of religion or anything else. We can have both. And I know that because we had it. We, we've done it. We we This is America. We had that system in place. And Ronald Reagan and company came along and said, you deserve more money. You shouldn't have to pay for all those people. You deserve to enrich yourselves. And they completely dismantled the pretty good system that FDR and company had set up. And the only thing I'm arguing for, and I don't pretend to answer for Bernie Sanders, or Elizabeth Warren, or anything else. I only answer for myself. All I'm saying is, let's pick out the best parts of the system we had between 1935 and about 1979. Let's pick out the best parts of that and let's implement them here today. And who do you think is going to do that? Right now, I don't think anyone. I'll vote for you if you're going to do it. And and tr and trust me, I mean, I if you move to Florida, I'll vote for you. <laughs> it's if I had a I had a staff member on a previous publication who asked me why I wasn't in charge of messaging for the DNC. He said because he's like the way you talk about this, everyone would vote for you. Like you should run for office. I'm like I would never do that. Um, that I mean, that, economically speaking, that's all I'm asking for is we we've created an individualistic, late capitalistic dystopia where we've advantaged a few over the many and with a an ever so slight readjustment still having very wealthy people living in a very wealthy country a slight readjustment would radically change the lives of people and here's the best part when the masses are doing well and we're in that mass affluence they're going to need wealth management they'll so buy you're going to say that bill gates won't miss a billion or Elon Musk won't miss a billion because they have so many. Oh my goodness. I think the vast majority of the 1% in this country will still be doing just fine. And I'm not even saying we need to go back to 70% tax rates like we had in 85. We could go back to the tax rates of the 90s and so, probably uh, do okay. Like we don't necessarily need to really soak them. We just need to kind of soak them. And we could build a mass affluent society that would do very well. And I've always said, I would like the fiscal year budget for 99, 2000. I want the defense budget to be about 600 billion. And I want right. those tax rates. And I think as a society, we could do very well for ourselves on that basis. And you know, your capital gains tax is only 20%. So let me, let me pick a scab. But let me pick a scab. You have a lot of illegals coming in. You have a lot of the blue cities, the sanctuary cities that are diverting funds that normally would go to the citizens and they're diverting them to the migrants. Okay. Right. So I read last week, and I can't remember what county it was. 
uh, that escapes me. But they were lowering the hours at the Department of Motor Vehicles. They were closing a community center one day a week, and they were lowering other um, services that were available so that they had money to provide to migrants for food, shelter, cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I saw that as well. And I don't remember where it was either. I don't remember yes, where I saw, it and was. And I was hor I was horrified. I'm like, why are you drawing down city services? City like, services, yes. Yes. I mean, oh my goodness, like that's well, there wasn't enough money to go around. Yeah. Yes. No, it, it was very disturbing. A, immigration is a subject in which I'm very conservative. And I've said this many, many times. I'm not a fan of illegal immigration in any form. I'm not a fan of how tech companies use H1B visas to press down wages of Amer American workers. Um, and I would like us to have a robust, civilized, inexpensive immigration system. I think you cannot I, have an inexpensive one. Well, in, not inexpensive for us, inexpensive for the immigrant coming in. One of the problems with legal immigration is by the money standards of the rest of the world, it's incredibly expensive to immigrate to America. Those fees should be tailored to the countries people are coming from we're going to pay a lot of money and that's fine i think that investment in having a robust immigration system that makes it easy for people to come go home come and go be temporary workers all this type of thing is by and large a good thing i think preventing companies from abusing the h1b visa system is a good thing i think taking steps to mitigate the flow of people walking over the border which these days includes arab people people from africa chinese people There's ukrainian refugees coming in people yeah. escaping ukraine flying to mexico city walking across the border. i mean this is insane that is worth the investment to bring to a halt but it's never going to happen because, as I wrote in America's Faustian Bargain with Immigration, there are far too many corporate interests who rely on that cheap and inexpensive labor. Well, and Chuck Schumer, flow, of all people, said last week they will that, scream. that if we stop illegal immigration, who is going to pick the vegetables and fruits in a field? Americans will starve. When I heard Chuck Schumer said say that, you know, it it, it just solidified in my mind that the man is totally delusional. And the only reason New Yorkers send them to Washington, they don't want him in New York. <laughs> I mean, the, the, but, here, but here's the sad reality is, ask every farmer in the Inland Empire of California how they get their vegetables picked, and they'll tell you. Call up, I'm from Northwest Arkansas. Tyson Food, back in the day, used to send vans down to the border to pick up migrants to go process chickens in Fayetteville. It was the worst kept secret in town. It was, oh, it was gee, the worst kept secret in town. Can't, can't they pick vegetables using AI and chatbots? <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, it's kind of funny. There are some really great ve vegetable and fruit harvesting machines that are coming down the pike, but we're not oh. quite quite there yet. But yes, it would be, chat GPT should get to work pulling some strawberries. Um, Give, give itself some use. Uh, there's a couple other concepts in your material I sent over. That are worth talking about, especially we've we've burned through forty five minutes. Um, oh, okay. Yes. So some of the some of these are are funny, and I think it would be interested to to hear you talk about them. One of your show ideas was: Are Republicans fiscally demented? I thought that was interesting. Uh, why is America being erased? Um, is a cure for our broken political party system even possible? Who's responsible for the dumbing down of America? What are the top 10 reasons to vote for a conservative candidate in 2024? And most ironically, my mother probably wants to know about this, is how to shut down your crazed liberal relatives. So I tell your mother voice. very specifically to go to eocritic.com, like equal opportunity, eocritic.com. And all those materials, they can download them. I have quizzes. I have special reports. I even have videos. But your mother would love that PDF of how to shut down your liberal relatives at the next holiday dinner. Yeah, no, yes, I just have to send. I'll have to send her over. <laughs> but I mean, let's let's at a top level, let's think about this. Like, are Republicans fiscally demented? Well, yes, they started a war for twenty years and lowered taxes. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Um, and we're going to be my generation will be paying that off for the rest of our lives. Um, but the, I. I not to be mean or anything, but I feel like this this book, this talk, this whole thing 
is this typical sort of talking point of the country's going to hell in a handbasket. How do we hang on to the way things used to be? Because I don't think there's anything typical like about it, it Cameron. What I wanted right. to achieve was to raise awareness of how bad bad has gotten. Okay. And many people, they go to work, they come home, they eat dinner, they play with the kids, they watch television, they go to sleep and they do it again. Right. Okay. The next day. And they really have no clue about what's going on, especially in sanctuary cities or blue cities, what, however you want to label them. And what I wanted to do is just spend a moment or two making people aware, do you know this is happening in this country? Do you know that ranchers could, could apply for a loan, but only if they're a minority, okay? If they're not a minority or they're not a woman, they cannot get the loan, okay? And I remember something, equal protection under the law. The government cannot cherry pick who gets the benefit. So Cameron, you like me, I'm, I'm a big fella, okay? And I weigh well over 200 pounds, okay? I don't see any grants coming to me because I'm fat, okay? Okay? <laughs> So and, not, yes. and I'm not going to ask for it. But the point is, because I'm white or I'm Jewish or I'm fat or I'm in Florida, I don't get money because of any of those things. OK, you know, I'm Jewish. I want money from from Egypt. They wronged my people for generations. I'm waiting for a check. I'd rather have it in gold based on my weight. <laughs> OK, I want it right on that. Like... And I want it tomorrow. <laughs> OK, but it's not coming. So all I wanted to do was really raise awareness. And if people don't like what they see, let them get off their ass, become involved locally, you know, give to charitable or political causes that they feel strongly about. And on November 5th, get your ass off the couch and get up and vote. Every I mean, I'm always a fan of people getting involved at the local level. I'm always exhorting people, please go to your city council meeting, please go to your local school board meeting, school board, exa know, fire exactly. district, whatever. I mean, yeah. I'm all because more governance, and I don't even tell people get involved at the state level. More governance happens at the state capitol on down today than ever happens in Washington, D.C. If you really want to change your community, right? That's where you're gonna need start to start locally, gra grassroots. Yes. And that is, and, and, and it doesn't mean that it's need to be a huge time commitment, but just get understanding those issues, you know, getting involved even at, on a single issue or at the most simple level is going to do more good for democracy than almost anything else. Cameron, I spoke with, with a young lady last week. She lives in Richmond and I forgot the issue that she took, you know, a problem with. She called the governor's office every day for a year to complain about whatever the issue was. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the governor's office, all the staff know who she is, okay? Right. And she is in their face every single day. How much good it did, I have no clue. But that's not a bad way to start. No, I mean, it can, it can certainly be a way to galvanize people, to galvanize support all this type of thing. And that's, I mean, I think that's, you know, and I always say about this, you know, especially with my younger, younger, you know, readers and all this type of thing. I said, you know what? Social change takes time. Political activism is very unglamorous. Um, it's, I when I, I was part of the movement in 2012 to legalize cannabis in Colorado. And I said, it, you know what it was? It was standing in front of the grocery store every weekend for nine months, gathering the signatures to get it on the state ballot. It wasn't fun. It was hot. It was cold. It was rainy. It was, I mean, because we did three seasons, all of that. I said, it was hot in the summer. It was cold in the winter. It was not fun. But that's what it took for us to get this to happen. And all the work it took even to get to the point where we were gathering the signatures to get it on the ballot. That was a whole thing of all of its own. I, so I, I hear you. And I'll take the other side of that argument. Okay. So the guy that's- I'm not, I'm not saying that policy was good or bad. I'm just saying political activism is unsexy. But oh, no, it's you're, you're absolutely right. But when it comes to legalization of cannabis, the guy that's working on the brakes on the aircraft that I'm getting on, you know, to go visit my daughter, 
the fella who's working on the elevator in the office building when I'm going on the 22nd floor, I don't want them getting stoned before they go to work because they're they're using their travel bong, you know, that they keep under the seat in their car. Okay. I don't want the aircraft mechanic getting stoned. Okay. And if he does it over the weekend in his own house, fine. Don't do it on the way to work. Because I'm on I, that plane. Well, yes, I don't think anyone would argue with you about that. Certainly not myself. Okay. I'm right there with you. You're going to think um, twice before you go in an elevator. I already <laughs> think twice going in elevators. I've met people who work on elevators. Um, it's, and I think, you know, and I think the whole, you know, a coffin on a string, let's go. Um, that is kind of an odd contraption. And I've lived in tall buildings and everything. Um, yeah. I live on the ground floor now for a reason. Um, I just have to go up <laughs> some steps. Um, it's no, no, no. I mean, it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, but the point is social change takes time. And it takes even, time and you're right. It's unsexy. It's, it's unglamorous. Unsexy, it's very unglamorous. And what, whatever it is you're advocating for, I don't care what that is because we can have robust debate and we make the, the call, send the email, write the letter. Yes. You know, rate, you know, find $25 to put together some basic yard sense, all this type of thing. That is a very important thing. And, and also when it comes time to, you know, choose representation and i say this for you know those of us who are under 45 i said you know how you know the reason why it's very hard for us to know other politicians because we don't vote in primaries you know who does our parents because they know that if they get to pick the candidates in the general election and it matters. they're going to get there yeah they're, it matters and they're going to get matters. the people they want so yeah. if we want to seize power from these folks then we have to take a similar strategy the problem the problem and here's where you'll like this here's the thing it's not necessarily something that makes for great content on social media. Sure. It's very important work, but it's not necessarily a fire TikTok or a good Instagram reel. So that, and I think, you know, there's a too much complaining on social media platforms and not enough advocacy to go out and say, okay, let's try to make this happen. So I'm always encouraging people, you know, and giving them the resources. And that's great. That's I'm great. And, and I commend you for that. Yes, and I'm working on a new course on civics to teach people how their government actually works because people really have no clue. It's kind of sad. Um, and so, so it's a very important thing. But I don't Do they teach civics in high school anymore. No, they don't. Because it doesn't appear on the standardized tests. They only cover math and science. So no, I've I've met young people like 19, 20 year olds who genuinely can't name three branches of government. They don't know. Wow. It's frightening. Um, so, um, but one of the, I mean, as we kind of come to a close, one of the things I don't, I guess, understand, and maybe this will be a good cherry on top of our little discussion, is why do you feel like America is being erased? There are those in Congress that want to change the character and the structure of what made this country great. They want to see socialism replace capitalism. They want to see if you say something that they don't agree with, they want to be able to shut you down, whether it's your Facebook or any other kind of social media. I'm, I kind of like the First Amendment. Actually, I kind of like all the amendments. I like the second one. I like the fifth. And... I'm a great believer in the Constitution following the rule of law. What I've seen over the last three years in the Biden administration is the Biden administration running afoul of the Constitution, running afoul of the law. And in order to make sure that the laws are followed, someone has to sue somebody to stop it. I want government to follow the law of the land which is the United States Constitution. That's my belief. I mean, yes. Constitution I mean, isn't perfect, but it's as perfect a document as we have. Okay. I'm sure the Cameron Journal is up there. <laughs> but I, mean, I think I, the Constitution is a bit better. It has been 250 years. Maybe it's time for an update. Maybe. Our original document that, was That's why we have amendments. Yes. I mean, but there are some people who would argue it's time for a total overhaul. 
We need Maybe. to throw out the old and bring in the new. Bring in something new. Okay, is that through an armed revolution? I don't think it has to be. St- there, a lot of the states get rid of their... Co- Louis- the state of Louisiana has had five state constitutions. The well, states- you haven't been to Louisiana? <laughs> well, that, you, <laughs> that one I'll give you. <laughs> that, that one, yeah, that one I'll give you. Yeah, 10 points to... I guess 10 points to Roger. That's even not the best example. Um, but it's, I, I mean, there's some people, I mean, I think I, I get, I get a bit bothered when I hear people attack MLK for trying to be a founder of the country or trying to have a second founding or trying to fundamentally change things, all this stuff. Because I think, I, I think not always, but by and large, change is good, including more people is good. Our original constitution did not have provisions for women to vote. I was three fifths of a person, only for representation purposes. I couldn't vote. Um, you but know, now, was, now you're five fifths of a person. I know. I've gained two fifths in two hundred fifty years. It's Go crazy. have a party. Get some. I, get, get get some vodka. You know. Yes. Celebrate. Exactly. 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 Yes. Um. So I mean, I think I think that I mean there. I'm and I'm not saying that I'm not saying personally. I want to do a new constitution. I think with some modifications, what we got could work very well. Because I agree with you. It's I'm a always really open good to system. change. It's amazing it's held up this long. I think yeah. the founders themselves would be shocked. We're still using their system. But I do think it is time for big structural systemic change. What Cameron, let me, let me give you a plug good. for Netflix of all things. Mm. So I watched a seven-part miniseries on John Adams. Oh, yes. okay, on Netflix. It was superb. Get a hold of it. Watch it. it. The acting is phenomenal. And I didn't know that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on the same day, July 4th, 1826, when the Republic was 50 years old. Yep. They were political. They were friends, then rivals, then friends again at their death but it was such a marvelous telling of what was going on at that time but the constitution has provisions for change and i and i I agree with you but i think but i i I, if you've never if you've never gone and read the john adams biography by david mccullough i can't recommend it enough it's on my official book list at the cameron journal um it is one of the most exquisite biographies of a founder thanks for telling me about it i'll take a look yeah um, I read it high in high school twice, actually. Um, and it was it impacted me at a very deep level, so I always recommend it. Um, no, I mean I'm just saying, like on this idea, the title of your book is Raising America, on this idea that somehow we're losing we're losing something. I don't see us losing anything. I see us finally becoming, I think, the country we were really meant to be. That's another one hour podcast. It is. Uh, we could tackle that today. But with <laughs> 10 million illegals pouring across our border, I I would I would say I don't agree with that. I mean the uh, the reality is I I do a talk for corporations called Our Changing America and I talk about demographics and cultural changes and how you know things are shifting as the boomers retire and begin to pass on we're moving into a society that's dominated by the cultural values of gen x millennials and gen z um and those are very different values than the boomers had um and there's a lot changing in this country i think there's there's some great aspects to it there's some not so great aspects to it and i think we've been here before with the italians the irish the eastern europeans if we were having this conversation in 1924 a year before we banned immigration entirely for the next 40 years, um, people would be saying the same thing. Oh, God, they're, they're, Europe is sending their worst dregs here, boatload by boatload every day. Stop the flow. Um, you know, you, you it would be the same, the same thing. And then we ceased immigration for 40 years. Um, and, you know, we probably could do with that again. I think we need some time to kind of assimilate everybody and shake things out and figure out better ways of dealing with this sort of thing and navigating these difficult times. But I, like I said, the, my only thing is, you've been absolutely delightful, but I just, I really, I really struggle with this idea that we're, 
we're losing the country. Because I, I just... Are things great? No. Do we have a lot of things we need to work on? Absolutely. But I don't think we're losing the country. I think we're circling the drain. You know, I I went through about 52 different titles for for the book. Mm. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done was mixing and matching titles and subtitles. Mm. And maybe I'll send you my, my, my list of 50 finalists. See if there's something there that interests you. But thank you for a wonderful talk today. Yes. Well, this is the part of the show where we do plugs. So why don't you let us know? You already have it. Do it again. Let us know where people can find you online, where they can buy the book. So the book obviously is on Amazon. All books are on Amazon now. Erasing America, Broken Politics, Broken Country. My name is Roger Friedman. Roger with the D, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. The website is eocritic dot com like equal opportunity critic and you could sign up for a no cost monthly newsletter that i send out that has some pearls of wisdom that you might be interested in thank you and thank you for coming on the show i really appreciate it you're very welcome cameron have a wonderful day That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners, so please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Cowan on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal Podcast.